Welcome to the Money to the Masses podcast, putting you in control of your finances. One is an expert with years of experience giving free advice. The other owns his own microphone and can do the odd bit of editing. Here are your hosts, Damian Fay and Andy Leakes. Now, Damian, before we get on with this week's podcast, you had something quickly to say about our sponsors. Yeah, we've got a new sponsor, Money Farm, and Money Farm are an online investment advisor and one of the biggest digital wealth management companies in Europe. So a big thank you to them for sponsoring the podcast. Now, Money Farm create portfolios to maximise long-term returns using ETFs to make incredibly cheap portfolios. And you even get the first £10,000 of your portfolio invested without any charge from Money Farm. And if you enter the code M. TTM 20k into the box when you sign up you get the first £20,000 of your portfolio invested and run by moneyfarm.com without any charge. Great stuff, on with this week's show. Hello and welcome to episode 96 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always Damien Fay and me Andy Leakes. Damien good to see your face again my friend. It's good to be back Andy. You almost had a very interesting podcast because I I just had a quick shower. I was up against timing, so I almost did this podcast naked, which would have been <laughs> which would have been interesting for you, Andy. So, uh, such has been my week. I've been flat out. What's what's your week been like? Um, well, less nakedness by the sounds of it. Um, uh, yeah, not not really much going on. I, I had an interesting situation with a, a, a delivery the other day. I don't know if you want to hear about that. I do, Andy. My my week has been so. Um, uninteresting personally i want to hear about your delivery <laughs> <laughs> well we spent the last we spent the last three months looking for garden furniture as you do and uh, we're now sort of almost in august and we're finally at the time where we're going to buy it even though we've lost three months of spring and summer but there we go never mind we've we finally did it took the plunge and it was meant to be delivered on tuesday paid 40 pounds next day delivery and if, uh, don't ask me why. It's a long story. I was in, I was working in London, and my wife is a childminder, and to, it was to do with the timings of people being in, and so we just had to bite the bullet. We got a good deal on the furniture, so we thought, sod it, we'll pay an extra forty pounds for the delivery. At four o'clock on Tuesday afternoon, I called them and uh, said, "Look, I, I d- it's four o'clock. It says up until six. I don't mind necessarily if it doesn't arrive. I'd just rather know, just so I can plan it and prepare it." And she said, no worries, Mr. Leakes, I'll just check for you. I'll give you a call straight back. Brilliant customer service. She called me back 10 minutes later. Yes, just to confirm, spoken to the delivery company, spoken to the driver. It will be there by six o'clock. Brilliant, I said. You've been absolutely brilliant. Quarter past six, they called me to say, Mr. Leakes, we've got your furniture here. Would you like it delivered Thursday, Friday or next Monday? (laughs) (laughs) So I said, uh, well, that's very kind of you to give me those options, but um, we were expecting it to arrive 15 minutes ago. I mean, it was a long conversation. It was a convoluted thing. Um, It was all to do with third party couriers, overnight carriers, people putting economy stickers on pallets that should have been next day advanced and um, speaking to various different people all around the country. And eventually um, it was delivered by sort of half past 11 the next morning, luckily. And we got our delivery money, uh, the £40 back. But, can I ask, Andy, yeah. can I ask, mm. what type of furniture was it? Is it, that, is it, is it like rattan stuff? It's, it, it is that, yeah, awful no, 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 garden no, sofas. No, no. Yeah, the, the rattan I, I'm, furniture. I'm not yeah. saying it's awful because I bought some earlier in the summer. Oh, okay. And the reason I'm asking... <laughs> Because I think I know the company that you probably bought your furniture from because my brother, again, this is sort of veering off topic, but my brother had the exact same problem as you, but even worse, to the point that the furniture never turned up and it wasn't just a day late, it was like weeks and weeks and weeks late. So um, I think it's the same company. It's quite a big one that does rattan furniture. So if you're listening to this podcast... It's one of the biggest. (laughs) So if you're listening to this podcast and you're going to buy rattan furniture then I would I, I would question any delivery uh, slots you're given because I've spoken, obviously, Andy for the first time here on this story, but my own twin brother, who lives around the corner, who had the biggest nightmare with this company and delivering it, and um, I think he ended up going elsewhere because the delivery... And the guy was giving him all the similar stories that were probably genuine... 
but you know the detail about you just said economy stickers. Who cares? It doesn't really matter, does it? You just want the furniture. It's like yeah. that's that's your problem. And he- it was ridiculous. I was on first name terms with a guy called Billy who worked at Jemson's third party couriers in Rye um, <laughs> with Pete. <laughs> Pete, who worked for a company called Transactions, um, and that was somewhere in Tame in Oxfordshire. And uh, yeah, I was on first name terms with everybody. It got to the point where when I was phoning these people up, they, they were just calling me by my first name. We were, you know, it was just uh, it was just like a, speaking to a friend in the yeah, end. Yeah, just a friend who lets you down. But that, that a tip straight away on a store you got there, do check it. But another thing, you may as well have waited now, Andy. A lot of the summer's passed because apparently September is the best time to buy garden furniture because things are seasonal and it goes out of stock. And now is obviously peak prices but you've got a good deal so that's that's Damien good. you are singing my tune what do you think I've been saying to my wife for the past well two and a half months we, we got the idea in our heads three months ago and it got to the point where it was late July and I said to my wife look let's just wait till September now let's bite the bullet uh, pay rock bottom prices and really get it get it in for next year and we'll be getting a really good really really good deal and uh, no she wasn't having any of it so yeah we pay top price for uh, something we're only going to use for four weeks <laughs> <laughs> but your ears won't get bent though, will they, Andy? No, I'll tell you yes. what, it's a story I've heard before. Right, on to the podcast, on to the money stuff. Yeah, what we got coming up this week? Right, we've got two meaty pieces. One of them is around the story that's been broken this week about banks that are cutting interest rates and potentially charging people negative interest rates on their bank. What that means is the idea that they'll actually charge you to have your money in a savings account with them, which is completely bonkers. Wow. So we're going to talk about that. I had a, uh, a number of journalists call me up in a panic and ask me what I thought about it. So I'm going to give podcast listeners the full waltz and all on that. The second piece we're going to do this week is uh, based on an email I got from Dan Coelho out there. A brilliant email. It must have taken him half an hour to write it. And we actually started a conversation on the website, on the 8020 Investor page, where you can see more about it and potentially sign up and take a free trial. Because do you remember, Andy, I said there's a there's a little chat window that pops up when you're on there and you can talk directly to me. And Dan started chatting to me through that little window. He then sent me a, a very long-winded email, which I asked him to, for some ideas about the pod, to talk about on this very podcast. And his one is about shorting the market and really the idea of not knowing what to do he wants to invest but he's reading so much out there lots of pessimistic stuff that he's almost caught in inertia of, and actually not doing anything so he wanted to, he wanted my opinion on what should he do and what should he um, think when he's reading all that stuff and then i just want to touch on the end of the podcast just a bit of a um a sort of a Damien's note, but like, do you remember Jerry Springer used to have a little bit at the end of his shows than the days called gone Thought by. for the Day, wasn't it? Yeah, and it, I think it was something like that. It's going to be less cheesy, but just a comment I really wanted to make about the economics um, out there and the sort of numbers we're seeing coming out and a lot of stuff that's going on, on social media about it. So anyway, I'll start with the banking interest rate. So what's happened is this week a number of banks came out and started to announce they were going to make changes to their uh, the interest rates they charge. So I'll give you some examples. For one of them was Santander. And we've talked about it on the podcast before. They, there's a very popular account they've got called the 123 Current Account. Yeah. And that's the account where they gave you, I think it was 3% up to about £20,000 of savings. It was a high interest paying current account, but there are other benefits like cashback and uh, other bits and pieces on there. And they announced that they're looking or it was released that they were looking into cutting the interest rate uh, from 3% to 2% they're going to pay. Elsewhere, HSBC uh, had decided that their business accounts that have foreign currency uh, were going to be charged negative interest rates. Now, the negative interest rate idea is fascinating. The notion that rather than you actually earn interest, so positive interest, you'd get negative interest, i.e. you'd be charged money for leaving on deposit with them and of course that so in that situation you're actually better off stuffing that money in your mattress at home well theoretically yeah i mean it's exactly that and of course you can imagine this caused a massive stir in the national press and on the on the news and and another and a number of other banks started to um slip out some sort of noises and uh, bury a little bit of this news one of them well natwest and rbs have said that they might have to well it, it came to light they might have to charge 
negative interest rate to customers in the event that there are negative interest rates in the economy. Now, I'm going to come on to what that means because they, they, they reckon that would affect probably 1.3 million customers. And these are business customers they're talking about. And Halifax have an account um, elsewhere where they were cutting rates. So what is all this cutting rates and um, potentially going negative rates all on about? And now this is a result of the Bank of England and central banks globally cutting the, their benchmark rate. So you know it's 0.5% at the moment. Yeah. Where the economies out there are so fragile... Central banks what have done, they've actually cut interest rates hundreds of times around the world globally. And the, I saw a brilliant line the other day, um, death by a thousand cuts. And it, really what it is, is that they're just saying that we're trying to boost the economy, they cut interest rates. And the idea being that it actually makes credit cheaper in the economy and it actually makes the idea of trying to save money less incentive to do so, so you're more likely to go out and spend that money and so are companies and that's the idea behind why they cut interest rates and the the, the thing is it's, it's not fantastic because you can't live like that forever so the death by a thousand cuts is actually it's pretty bad to be having an economy that's driven solely by that at some point you're gonna have to wean it off it now the flip side of that is that in a world where the benchmark interest rate is within the economy is so low banks struggle to make money well their profits are eaten into because the investments that they have, they make less money on, and the deposits they, that they themselves place elsewhere and with central banks earn less money. And in a world where central banks have gone negative, they've cut them so much, so desperate are they to boost their economies, that in some places in the world, like Japan, they've actually gone to negative interest rates. So what that means is that if banks or whatever deposit their money with the central bank, they get charged for it effectively. Now, in a world where banks are struggling to make uh, a profit they find it harder in a world where interest rates are so low they are therefore thinking about passing that on to uh, business customers and retail customers now business customers are fairly easy to attack first which is why these noises are going on about charging some of them negative rates particularly if they hold in foreign currencies let's be honest if you hold it in a in a um, foreign currency that's already exposed to negative rates then they are saying well look it's costing us money to put this money somewhere so it should start to cost you money does that make sense yeah but the reason why they're doing it as well is because in the uk in particular a lot of the products that they use to sell that made banks lots of money think ppi that's a good one they've they've been um stopped or there's been huge backlash against them so banks are struggling to come up with ways to basically screw us over and profit and therefore it means that the idea that that we can have free banking because not everywhere in the world has free banking free banking is um, a bit of a institution in this country it's taken for granted that we can bank anywhere and not be charged for it now we've getting to the point where all the banks are quite rightly being stopped from profiteering in certain ways by products or excessive charges then it's starting to look like free banking may come under threat and they might start to charge we already see packaged accounts being charged for so you pay five pound ten pound or maybe more a month and you get a bunch of benefits supposedly packaged up that makes it cheaper yeah i'm still paying 25 pounds a month for mine exactly andy because 25 pounds a month see because of andy leaks we are we he andy is protecting our future right to free banking <laughs> by, and, by, and for that for that money i've got both my mobiles Phones insured. Uh, I go on holiday once a year with travel insurance and uh, what else is it? Oh, AA cover, which I haven't claimed on for uh, twelve years. Yeah. So but yeah, just just go and break down somewhere, Andy. But what I was asked, the reason why people panicked is, what does this mean? Are we really going to get into a world now where we are not only going to be perhaps charged to bank where it's free now, but are we going to start seeing current accounts, for example, um, applying negative interest rates rather than? Well, nothing as they most of them pay hardly anything and what, I, what my response to all this was is, is don't panic i don't think that's going to realistically happen just yet but the idea that banks have been cutting the interest rates that they pay people it's, it's been going on for years it's been going on ever since interest rates were cut down to 0.5 percent back in 2009 it's been a slow unwinding of slow sort of death of interest rates really and the fca even re released a paper very recently uh, exposing some of those accounts that pay very poor rates so some that pay less than the current 0.5 percent base rate i mean that's nothing I mean, if you're getting that you might as well just 
like you say, put the money under the mattress. Not that I would encourage that because someone might break in and steal it. But if you want to find that paper, you can go on our Facebook page and I link to it. So if the Bank of England cuts interest rates soon, it might be as soon as next week if you're listening to the podcast on time, but at some point in the future, then there's going to be more pressure on banks' profit margins. So they may start trying to uh, recoup some of this. Now, I don't think... This is just my view. I don't think that we're going to see negative rates in retail banks um, widely. I'm not even sure we'll ever see it happen. Now, the reason I don't is because, as you just said, Andy, people are quite sensitive to the idea of being paying, um, being charged to have their money stored somewhere. So what's to stop people just going to get their money and putting it under a mattress? And if people in the industry don't think that will happen... If you look over into Japan, when Japan had negative interest rates, as it does now, when it first started, there was a massive surge in the number of people buying safes to go and store their money at home. So so if we have negative interest rates, if they do really come to the UK, then invest in a company that builds safes or sells them because you're going to be a big surge. So actually, what I think... Or just become a thief. Oh, or just become... Yeah, (laughs) I I suppose that's always... I'm trying to think of something slightly more ethically minded and legal, but hey, if that (laughs) that floats your boat. But what I think will happen is actually people like you, Andy, who have packaged accounts, will probably notice the fees on those accounts start to get nudged up higher or some of the benefits that you enjoy but maybe don't use start to get withdrawn because it's far easier to charge somebody who's already expressed a, an indifference to paying for banking a little bit more than to start charging somebody who's never paid for banking, start charging them a fee or giving them negative interest rates, which effectively is the same thing as charging yeah. a fee. So that's where I think we're going. You're going to see lots in the press about all this negative rates and if the Bank of England does cut interest rates further, then we could start to see um, banks reducing interest rates down to almost nothing but that's already been happening i'm not convinced we're going to see negative interest rates but if you do then don't forget you can use the banking bank switching service which will move your current account within seven working days hassle free apparently sort out all your direct debits i mean that's another reason why i think we won't see large scale negative interest rates because when that's been now that's been brought in people can move around much freely but one of the things i just wanted to point out before i finish this section is that the Bank of England and the powers that be are quite pleased, probably, that if you started to get charged negative interest rates. And the reason they are is because they really want you to go and spend your money. Because, let's be honest, if I was sitting there being charged money for having it in deposit, like you say, I'm going to take the money out of the bank. Or worst case scenario, I'm certainly probably going to spend it. If I was thinking of buying anything, a holiday or anything at all, and with inflation being, okay, it's pretty low, but it's picked up a little bit and it might pick up more then your money is not only worth less as days go by because of inflation but it is because also worth less because the bank's taken a nice little chunk you're going to just go and buy those things and the bank of england and the powers that be want that to happen because it will boost the economy in a post-brexit world if the economy falls off a cliff as some people think it will do which is will link nicely to the final piece in this podcast good um just briefly on, on the interest rates, and it really is just a brief throwaway question from me, because it's been such a long time since we've had uh, an increase or a cut, remind me again, can they go to quarter of a percent or is it? do they move in just half a percent, i.e. we're at half a percent at the moment, we're at 0.5 aren't we, can it go to 0.25 or 0.75? It can go down to 0.25 or 0.75, yeah it can do, and I think okay. that people uh, are estimating that's where it will go, but beware of consensus because before this podcast this is an interesting note for even way off into the future if you listen to this podcast years down the line at the time of this podcast has been produced there was a the market was pricing a 97 percent certainty that interest rates would be cut next week so that is in uh, august 2016 now it'll be interesting to see if that actually occurs because they were meant to be cut last week if you believe what the market was saying and i don't really think uh, it will necessarily happen next week either. So always be wary of consensus, as we talked about before. And if it if it, if it does get cut, I think uh, a lot of people are expecting it to be nudged down slightly to 0.25. But we'll wait and see. Okay, so we had um, a lovely email. Well, you had a conversation on your eighty twenty chat facility, Damien, and um, 
a guy called Dan got in touch by email and uh, sent a question over regarding shorting the market. Now, I have no idea what this is about, so uh, I'm going to um, grab a coffee and uh, put my feet up and have a good old listen. <laughs> right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a snippet just from Dan's, uh, Dan's email. Just to give you a flavour, it's quite long-winded, but there's a lot of good content in it, but I'm going to try and summarise it so people don't nod off. So Dan's email was titled shorting and he said although he's aware of how it works and it runs contra to most general views he feels like the more research he does on the topic the more confused he is about what strategy to adopt whether it's shorting or just general investing and buying assets and he is more and more skeptical about all the sharks in the financial world out there and what to do and the potential problems that we all face and he's just effectively caught in a position of inertia frozen by the fear that's out there and what to do he lists a whole bunch of people out there who uh, provide research and one of them is rich dad i don't know if you've heard of him rich but rich dad poor dad is a guy over in america very very big and he's always recommending shorting the market and uh, doesn't recommend anything specific and blah 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 and it goes on and on and on what shorting is shorting the market is where you effectively bet the market's going to crash and now the idea that you would take out an investment strategy based on that is, yeah, if, if you're convinced it's going to fall, it seems vaguely sensible. Hedge funds do it all the time, not necessarily successfully, but they do. What I want to talk about is this whole idea of pessimism, because as Dan is saying, he doesn't really know what to do. He reads around the investment stuff and he becomes more frozen by the idea of what to do, because there's a lot of people out there who think the world is going to end at some point, the markets are going to collapse. And do you know what? There's a big part of me that thinks that's going to happen at some point as well. You can't keep uh, fiddling with markets, printing almost seemingly infinite amounts of money or cutting rates and just basically fudging and manipulating the system and the markets and not expect something bad to happen. And we do get reversals every now and then. Of course, these people are sitting there saying, oh, the world's going to end, the world's going to end, short the market, oh, you're full to enter it. Now, my my um, advice and why I want to help Dan is that there's a brilliant quote I stumbled across recently, and it is that pessimism is always sounds smarter than optimism because pessimism sounds like someone trying to help, while optimism sounds like a sales pitch. And I think that pretty much sums up the, the situation. It's easy to be pessimistic. I mean, even I am inherently pessimistic about what the market's going to do going forward. I think there's a lot of more downside than there seems to be upside, but that's just a view. That's an emotional response to something that you're worried about almost like fear does that make sense yeah and so i've known so many people in the investment world who have been banging on about for years that the market is going to crash and the FTSE is going to fall down to four thousand, and they keep almost like the crazy doomsayers the world's going to end interestingly andy i don't know if you know but the world is supposed to end today so hopefully you can edit and get the podcast out relatively quickly because some of the uh uh, some <laughs> crazy group out there has predicted today's ga- the world's going to end today. Now that is ultra pessimistic, and um, inevitably the world isn't going to end. But the thing is, those people is a brilliant example because just like those people, if you say something long enough, if you keep saying the world is going to end or the markets are going to crash, then at some point they will. And what happens is those people sit there and go, "See, I told you so. I was right," and that is a far easier stance to take because yes you will be proved right in the end the world will end the markets will crash but those people are never uh, very rarely have any conviction and don't put any money and they just sit on the sidelines and say things like keep your powder dry the market will crash you can buy in then i could tell you uh, a number of people who i used to work with or people i've met in the industry who have done that for years and their clients have missed out on a lot of money give you an example last year when i started investing the fifty thousand pounds on 80 20 investor if you're new to the podcast go and look at it but the diy investment service i run i invest fifty thousand pounds live and well the market has upped and downed and struggled and the FTSE is probably up a couple of percent at most the portfolio i run is up over 11 percent now if i'm honest and i was very honest at the time had I been being emotional about it, I wouldn't have wanted to put £50,000 right into the market at that point if I was trying to market time back in March 2015 because the market was at all-time highs. Everyone was saying the things are going to collapse, etc., etc. So if you'd just been pessimistic, I would have sat there and done nothing. 
And the idea is you have to just engage. You're better off just engaging with the uh, market and not being emotional about it because you will just miss out. There's a guy called William Littlewood who's a fund manager. He's a very interesting uh, example of this. He runs a fund called Artemis Strategic Assets. You can go and look at it. It's been on a lot of buy lists for some big platforms out there, which, as an aside, is gives you a lot of insight into how those fund lists are picked because this chap's fund has bombed. It has been performing badly for years, since its launch, I think, back in, I think it was 2009. And because Mr. Littlewood, what he did is he's placed some big shorts, some big bets on the market that the there would be a huge downside now, particularly on bonds. And one of the things he did is he bet that that in a world where there's lots of QE, Western economies in huge amounts of debts, which will be probably they'll default on, it will go unpaid, which is bad for bonds. Inflation will pick up because lots of more money they've printed washing around the system, and that's bad for bonds. In in, in short, uh, excuse the pun, he um he basically is betting there's going to be some sort of meltdown, and he's been wrong. And just recently, Hargreaves Lansdowne has dropped his uh, his fund from one of their best buy list to a sort of second tier best buy list. And I remember seeing him years ago uh, in a fund manager meeting and I walked into the room and I was pretty much the only person in there and he looked like a man who was sort of a little bit lost. I think he'd been trying to tell people he's going to be right in the end. The rest of the world yeah. is crazy. They don't know what they're talking about. He says, just, I just don't understand it. It's just bonkers. And I felt a little bit sorry for him and he probably will be proved right. The problem is he's so far behind the market at the moment, his own benchmarks, that when he is, has been proved right, people could have uh, made a lot more money in the meantime and perhaps when the market turns, be able to get out and still be on a profit. So there are really good examples of people who are doomsayers and pessimists and want to short the market that don't make money. Of course, there's always going to be somebody, uh, some of the big investors who've done it, who um, George Soros famously shorted the pound many years ago and almost broke the uh, Bank of England and made billions overnight. But generally, people who are pessimists who don't get involved and don't enter the market end up missing out. And like I say, if you don't have a... Uh, if you take emotion out of investing, 80-20 investor, it's not just a plug for that idea, but that's why I built the whole concept. It's based on... Uh, it takes the emotion out of it. It's based on um, an algorithm and a lot of quants and okay I do do research around the outside to give people some of the more opinion based stuff but just so they understand what's going on not to drive um, their investment decisions so what I would say to Dan is yeah take those ideas and listen to what people are saying and it kind of gives you um, a steer of yeah the, the risks that are out there it's a bit like you and I Andy if you're going to cross the road you know the risks you know where to perhaps you don't want to cross on a corner or behind a parked car you know what the risks are but it doesn't stop you actually crossing the road and it's the same thing with investing you can either sit on the sidelines and never make any money but it's far better to ride a trend and do you know what when it goes down you will go down with it but then to ride it back up the other side because these people are trying to market time and you will never perfectly market time and it's very easy to be a what they call a bear which is where you're very pessimistic because at some point you'll be proved right. It's far harder to pick uh, investments that make money like we've done over the last year when in a market everyone's saying your world's going to end. And do you know what? It's just stick to a process and you should be okay and ride that wave up and down. Good stuff. Interesting, Damon. Kept quiet there because I was learning as I was going along. I've got a very small amount of money invested and uh, it, it helps me out too. Um, Oh, yes. Damien's thought for the day, Jerry Springer style. What, what have we got? Well, my, my thought for the day, Andy, is what, what did you, what's your view on all this new noise about the economy? Do you, do you think the economy is getting worse or better after Brexit? Or do you just not know? Yeah, I, Damien, it's a good question. I, I just don't know. I'm one of those people that, that sits and reads uh, from afar and doesn't, doesn't really understand. We, I don't know if we're any better off or not. What's going on? I'm confused. It's Randy. But that's the that's the best place to be. Sometimes is to be, as you say, confused. Because uh, what I just keep seeing on social media and in the in the press is lots of people who are trying to champion the idea that yes, I was right. See, voting to leave. All these peak doomsayers. All these people who said the world is going to end. Nonsense. Look, we've seen McDonald's are creating so many more jobs. Or the GDP for quarter two in the UK is actually up and. The thing is, you've got to. What my final real thought of it today is that I wish people would stop trying to 
um, justify a vote they had in a referendum that happened a month ago. We need to move on beyond that. Because what I see is people just slinging mud. So as soon as there is one sign that actually things aren't so bad, which most of that data is actually pre the referendum anyway, they then go on about it. And it's the same in the media. And the reason I mention it is because I, I've been asked to comment this week on various bits and pieces. And this is, again, another insight into how your money pages are uh, created. I was reminded that the newspaper in question was pro-Brexit. And that is obviously, I mean, I just give my opinion regardless. I don't tailor it to be pro-Brexit or whatever. It's just this is my view. If they want to take it, they can. So it just shows you that people are picking the bits of information they like that come out. I wish people would stop doing it. We don't know how the economy is going to fare. Is that there's um, The Bank of England are sort of making noises. They're worried about it. The next day, they seem to be fine. So let's just see what happens. And if it's good, if it's bad, let's stop slinging mud about the idea of what we voted for in a referendum because we all voted blind. We didn't. We're trying to justify choices that we made a month ago based on something that then happens afterwards and say, let's see, we told you so. So let's just stop doing it. We don't know what the economy is going to do just yet. And let's wait and see. Sorry for the rant, Andy, but I'm just getting bored of the idea that we, we're getting filtered information from all over the place about what the economy is doing. Let's wait for the numbers. Good. Sensible advice. Um, excellent pod. Enjoyed it. Anything else to add before we wrap this up? No, I, I think what I might do next week is try and do a piece on Dan. Again, Dan did, did a brilliant... Um, uh, his, his email he mentioned about teaching kids to invest and the idea of is there a way of teaching them and um, it's something we've not covered on the pod before we've done something on teaching children how to uh, engage with money but maybe I'll look at something about teaching how to introduce the idea of investing to people but either way if you've got any questions or topics you want covered on the pod do send them across you can get me on the email podcast at money to the masses or you can tweet me at money to the masses with a number two or you could just write to say hello and if you haven't got a question but you're itching to to type something on your computer or phone then get onto itunes and give us a review yeah <laughs> okay yeah give us a review and another thing just as while we're in the asking question area we are launching something called we're we launching really a hashtag if you can launch a hashtag um we're, we're doing video now and we're doing more we're going to go out and do more and more of them sort of short clips explaining things as i touched upon last week but now we've nailed it down really what we're going to do more and we're going to start people can actually tweet with a hashtag ask damien fay and it will we're going to do a series of videos that try and explain things in a minute or answer questions so Use that hashtag if you want to, something like that to be covered in a video. And we, we will do it. We're going to try and um, do as many as we can because no one's done anything like that before. And I think it would be interesting and challenging. Good. I'm looking forward to that. Um, am I exempt from that or can I send my own questions? You, you can send your own questions, Andy, if, if, you, if you wish to get the ball rolling. <laughs> okay. Good stuff. Until next week. See you later. Until next week, Andy. Bye-bye. Don't forget to claim your free copy of Damien's best-selling book, The 30-Day Money Plan. Sort your finances in just five minutes a day, worth $4.99. Just go to moneytothemasses.com slash podcast to find out how.